Francis. Welcome to this activity. I want to recognize, first of all, uh, Louis Krishok, the U.S. Charge d'Affaires, who is with us this evening. Also, uh, Lisa Francis from the Ministry of Education. I also want to recognize with us here today, Andrea McLeod. She is the instructor of arts at TAMCC and St. George's University. Also want to recognize um, Bernard and Lisa Basque, who are research assistant to Professor, or Pro <laughs> um, Ash, who is, um, you'll hear from this evening. Also want to recognize Dr. Benoit, who is behind all of this activity that we have in here. He's Professor of Sociology in the School of Arts and Sciences, and he's also the program director for our art courses. And the lady of the evening, of course, I want to, introduce, I want to recognize the presence of Professor Elizabeth Yasser Ash. She's our Fulbright Scholar, who is going to be doing the lecture today. Also, Ms. Lorna Dale Charles, who was the administrative coordinator of this activity. I also want to recognize the art teachers from Karyaku, who are here with us today, and of course, our teachers from other parts of Grenada, other officials from St. George's University, invited guests, students, both secondary. I'm pleasantly happy to see um, many of our secondary schools represented here today. Welcome and thank you for coming. Other invited guests, students all. On behalf of the School of Arts and Sciences, and on behalf of the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Hollis, I want to welcome you to this very special lecture on the role of arts in education. This is a very proud moment for us in the School of Arts and Sciences, as we are the first in the university community to host a Fulbright Scholar. We are happy to extend her services and expertise to the broader Grenada community, at, which include, of course, TAMCC and teachers of art in our primary and secondary schools, including teachers of art from Karaku, who are here with us today. <clears throat> we in the School of Arts and Sciences recognize and appreciate the role of art education in developing a well-rounded, creative, flexible, brilliant, thoughtful, innovative individual. We are working towards development of such a program and we think this is an excellent first step in sensitizing the public and reinforcing to the university the inseparable place of art in education. Once again, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome Dr. Yaros Ash and her students to Grenada and welcome you to this very thought-provoking lecture. I will now hand you over to Mr. Damien Graves, who will be the moderator for, today, for today's activity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Crawford, our chair of the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. And you can see she, she walks with great artistry. I'm your humble servant, Damien Graves, as she said, who will be moderating the session this evening. And I would like to introduce our lecturer this evening. First of all, I want to welcome you as well and welcome this opportunity for us to be able to understand the importance of art in education. In our part of the world, the Caribbean that is, I think that we have lost focus in our education system regarding the importance or the significance of art in education or arts in our education program. Our inordinate attention to what we consider to be the more academic subjects have given us a warp-sided view of what total education involves. 
And therefore we have lost the point in terms of engendering a certain amount of creativity. There are a lot of us who believe that art does not solve problems, but makes us aware of its existence. But we agree though, that arts education on the other hand does solve problems. In fact, there is a movement in that direction with years of research demonstrating the very close link to almost everything in various nations that we want our children to do and demand from our schools. Academic achievement, social and emotional development, civic engagement, equitable opportunity, arts education from the re available research shows a deep nexus. So involvement in the arts is associated with gains in math, in, in reading, in cognitive ability, in critical thinking, in verbal skill, you name it, it's there. Arts learning, we know from the research, can also improve motivation, concentration, confidence, and teamwork. So I want to introduce an individual who is extremely knowledgeable about this particular area. She is a Fulbright scholar. Elizabeth Yarros Ash nationally has been nationally recognized and is an award-winning artist, teacher, and juror with select awards for her exhibitions. She has shown in her 350 exhibitions, she has shown, sorry, over 350 exhibitions and has received over 80 exhibition awards. Dr. Yaros Ash, whose work has been reproduced in Splash 1 and 2, American Artists, Watercolor, Artists Magazine, Art Lies and Dialogue has taught at Midwestern University, State University in Wichita Falls, Texas since 1981. In 1991, she was selected for the university's Distinguished Hardin Professor Award and has been a full professor since 1992. She has been jurying exhibition since 1981, including the 1993 Watercolor USA exhibition and the 1995 Rocky Mountain National Water Media exhibition and the juror of awards for the 2002 National Watercolor Society exhibition. From 2002 to 2004, Professor Yaros Ash served as president of the Watercolor USA Honor Society. She has been selected as a Fulbright Specialist Scholar and will serve, and, and serve, will serve through 2018. In 2010, her work was reproduced on a label for Benziger Family Imagery Series Wines in Sonoma, California, and she was selected as a finalist for the Hunting Art Prize the largest art award in North America. Dr. Yaros Ash has traveled to a number of foreign countries, including Great Britain, Italy, Malta, Crete, Sicily, Cyprus, Paris, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, Easter Island, Chile, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Peru, and Spain. Her work is in over 90 corporate, institutional, and private collections. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the podium our Fulbright scholar, Dr. Elizabeth Yaros Ash, to speak to us on art in education.
Well, it's been a pleasure to be here. This has uh, been a wonderful experience so far, not the least of which is the workshop that we did at TAMCC uh, Monday through Wednesday of this week. And I see a number of individuals here from that experience, and we have made some wonderful, wonderful artworks. Uh, Andrea, thank you for being here. Okay, uh, at this point I wanted to introduce my students. Are they here yet? Liska, Bernard? Okay, well they're always on time for class. I just don't get this why they're late, but that was a little joke. <laughs> okay, when they come in or after uh, the presentation, I'll make sure that you uh, are introduced to them because uh, they acted as my research assistants over this past year and a half. They put together this PowerPoint presentation for me. They did the research, they took the photographs, and there's a wonderful video at the end. Uh, it is a little tour of our department at uh, Midwestern. It is the Juanita and Ralph Harvey School of Visual Arts. Uh, where I've taught in Wichita Falls, Texas for the past 32 years, going on 33. So I, I want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, their contribution uh, to this presentation this evening. Okay, are my lights down? Yes? All right. At this point, I'm wondering if uh, someone took my notes that were sitting here on the tabletop podium, <laughs> which I need. Yes, highlighted with blue. No, okay. Well, let's see if I can wing it without them. All right, we'll test my metal here. Why would you want your child to study art? Is that really a profession? It sounds mostly like playtime, doesn't it? Well, the stereotypes are out there. Uh, let's tick them off. Artists are not really intelligent. This is just civilized play. Artists have no intellectual capabilities. They just doodle and noodle. They're all talented anyhow. It just drips off their fingertips like diamonds. I don't really want my child to major in art, or I really love art, but that's just a pastime. It's not really a profession. I can't let my child major in art. How are they gonna make a living? I can't major in art. How am I gonna make a living? And so the image of a starving artist in a garret or studio someplace trying to eat their paintings to stay alive, survival, because I can't sell my paintings, is going to be thin. I won't have a car. I'll walk around in tatters. My cupboard will be bare. I'll be bad relationship material. Sounds like a horrible life. <laughs> I was riding in the elevator with my accountant after dropping my taxes off to be done one year. And he looked at me, this is one of the accounting assistants, and he looked at me and he said, I just don't know how you can make a living as an artist. My sister's an artist and she doesn't make a living. And I was paying him to do my taxes. <laughs> we don't just survive as artists, we thrive. What we do encompasses everything, everything that all the other academic disciplines encompass. We just spend more time doing it. To each one of your one hour lecture courses, we spend three hours in the studio accumulating empirical knowledge from experience. We must articulate orally in the written language we must think abstractly. We use both sides of our brains. 
Let me say that again. We use both sides of our brains. We know how to shift from left brain to right brain. We learn to see things, perceive things, and imitate things by shifting to our right brain. We know how to access and shift. Most people depend on their left brain. If they shift to the right brain, they can think more abstractly, but they use it in conjunction mostly with their left brain. So my talk is going to give you 10 big points. Critical life skills learned through the arts that you just can't learn any other place and you most certainly can't learn it in a lecture hall sitting at a desk. It is essential to training an entire individual, educating the whole person, not just the left side of their brain. Number one at the top of that list is creativity. Learning how to think creatively. How do you stimulate that in someone? The left side of the brain demands logic and rationality. The right side of our brain says anything is possible. So when we access creativity, and they teach this at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in their engineering department. When we teach creative uh, thinking, we must allow unusual pairing, unusual associations, unexpected visual experience. So we play with common perceptions, predictable outcomes. We'll take what is predictable, rearrange it, and make it an unexpected result. That's also called making the familiar strange and the strange familiar. It's what the Surrealists first did in modern art. So one of the practical approaches to doing this and this is up here for a reason, think outside the box. That's a cliche now, like pushing the envelope. We have to stay away from visual cliches and cliches and common patterns of thinking. Okay, we're human beings, we're biological units, we all think the same, we all experience the same. Yes, there are aberrations, but I'm talking about predominance. What your first idea is, is probably going to be everyone else's first or second idea also. So in order to access that part of the brain and that creative process, you have to purge all of that predictable thought. And you have to get to the point where now you're restricted. You've run out of those obvious solutions and ideas. Now you have to get beyond the visual cliches and the intellectual cliches. You begin to put things together that don't normally go together. And there are ways of doing this, of accessing accident and improbability and randomness. The, some artists play games and create tools that help them to access those particular kinds of tools. Here it is, make the familiar un familiar. This is an assignment that I gave my last drawing to class. Liska is also in this class. Uh, this is uh, a student who is wearing some rather unusual lipstick. I told the students we're going to do portraits but we're going to focus on your mouths. And the women, and this takes people out of their comfort zone. You can't play it safe if you want to be original. You can't play it safe if you want to express your authentic self. 
And this is what you nurture in children. You allow them to be whoever they are. As teachers, I don't determine what my students are going to major in. That's up to them. I'm there to enable it, nurture it when it shows up. I'd love them all to be painting majors, especially Bernard. He's great at everything he does, but he's thinking he's going to be a sculpture major, okay? Maybe a painting minor. But that's his life. That's his choice. Nobody gets to decide how you live your life and what you're going to be. This is a lifestyle I'm describing. This is a whole person, uh, not just part of you. It's not about jobs. It's about what kind of life do you want to live and the freedom to do that, to make your choices. Individuals, if you're timid about what it is you want to do, if you're choosing to be an artist, if you want to make work, you need to search out those individuals that support that. And you need to not listen to anybody that's negative about that. If that's your authentic self, your true spirit, you need to persevere towards that. After all, it's just one life. We only get to do it once, so far as we know. So this takes the students out of their comfort zone. Okay? That's the only place you come up with originality. You don't get it by doing the same old, same old, same old. So students are challenged to think of original things. Just because they thought of it the first time, sometimes their misperception is that, oh, it's original. But it's not. That's what I thought when I was a student. So the teacher is there to instruct on what is originality and push the student to go further with their thought processes and enable that invention. There it is. You invent, but if it's not polished or a higher level of thought and development, we must refine it and refine it and reinvent it and reinvent it so it goes to a more unique level. The second thing it does for a human being is it creates confidence, self-esteem. This, this is a really positive, life-affirming choice. As human beings, it's what we do that is not destructive. It creates something. It leaves a taste of what is best of humankind behind in the artifacts that we create. When a student works in my class, I keep sending them back, literally, to the drawing board to rework and rework and rework. And they learn to accept that objective observation. It has nothing to do with whether I like the student or not. It's about the artwork. How successful is it? And they learn to do that kind of critique with each other. Uh, this is from my university classroom, the painting studio. I teach uh, acrylic, oil, and watercolor painting. Uh, I teach paintings on canvas and on paper. I also teach figure drawing. I teach all of the drawing curriculum. I teach a professional practices class where students develop a professional portfolio, write to their body language, to the way they speak, the way they dress. Uh, we teach the psychology of art making. We get to the bottom of being blocked as an artist, a lack of ideas. The ideas are there. The only thing that keeps you from creating is fear. Uh, this young man, <laughs> he's, he's a homegrown Texas boy. I've never seen him without his gimme cap. Okay? And Mike likes that fake theatrical boxing. Uh, and I just don't get that, okay? 
His work is not about me and my tastes, okay? I can't make judgments about that, about him. He gets to do what he wants to. I want him to do it with quality and intelligence and skill. And I want him to be able to gain self-confidence in what he's painting about. So we talk about the art history, the historical connections to not well, only what they choose to do. This is the link, the legacy in the human chain okay, with artists within a society is reflecting what is going on in their time, in their place. George Bellows is his immediate history. And you see other examples on the wall. Here's another painting that he's done. So what is the message you're delivering? The content of the artwork. Are you communicating successfully visually? Because we don't use words. We're not writing this out. There's not a description that gets exhibited on the wall beside each painting and what it means and what it's trying to say. So I teach students to deliver their imagery with embedded content. And I refer to this as layered content and metaphor. And that's abstract thinking. So we suggest if we're too specific, that's called illustration. Illustration leaves no doubt about what the content of the artwork is. Narration, metaphor, is visual poetry. Uh, there's Bernard uh, doing some presentation on his artwork. To take command. We want students to be their own authority. And this is not theater. But when we have critiques and reviews in painting or drawing class, the student takes command of the classroom, stands up, and presents their work to the class with confidence. My students do a great job with this. So you are your own authority about what it is that you do. That's professional behavior. From the moment they enter the freshman class, they are taught how to behave professionally in, con in connection with their artwork. So again, self-esteem, confidence. Here's the comfort zone again. There are uh, several women that really were squirming out of their skin when we were using the lipstick. And I suggested a whole range of how they might look. Liska, in particular, was stomping and grumping around the studio. She wanted nothing to do with lipstick. Uh, I don't know whether you put a picture of yourself in here or not. But, uh, and Alex, Alexandra, uh, was, is, she's so shy, it's so painful, but she's one of the best draftsmen I've ever seen. We're human beings. And if you're a perfectionist like myself, I spent most of my life not accepting my humanity. I wasn't allowing for mistakes. I would get angry when I made mistakes. And so what that does, is that puts you in psychological turmoil. And you get into the phase of procrastination that puts you in paralysis. So... First thing I tell my students when they're learning to draw is accept your mistakes. You're going to make lots of them. I make lots of them. You just learn how to work with them and at times conceal them. It's not about an eraser. It's about embracing those mistakes as, oh, potential serendipitous uh, things that occur as well as I need to refine that. I need to revise that. This is realistic. Okay, let's get on with that job of fixing this, okay? Everything I do is not perfect and precious. I have to look at it objectively and decide, wow, that really is, is not very good. 
I need to make some modifications in it. It's not about crumpling up my drawing and throwing it in the trash. I don't let students do that. There are always options. There's always some information that you can extract from that experience by perseverance and working through it. It's not about a perfect drawing. It's about your attitude and willingness to persevere. And that's what I teach. There it is, be one's own authority. Uh, this student is from Africa. We have a large international community on campus. We are a uh, Euro-NATO pilot training base at Shepard Air Force Base in town, so we really are a global culture. You can't be in this world today, even on your island, and be totally isolated. There's the internet. We are a global community, like it or not. You are out there in the world. So he's got a tribal mask on there, and he's doing self-portraits, and he's doing self-portraits that are autobiographical. And this is one of our first semester freshmen, all age groups here. It's not just about being 17 to 21 years old. You're learning aside from, beside, all ages of adults. We had a woman in our ceramics program who was 85 years old, who could beat the pants off any teenager in that class when it came to throwing on the wheel. Yeah? And boy, she was, she was wonderful in the classroom. She would take them to task <laughs> for being lazy. Freshmen presenting their work. What, when you know you're going to be in front of a group presenting your work, do you want it to look good? Do you want to try extremely hard to have it be your best effort so we draw the best out of people? It's not just a, a, a dog-eared tablet paper that I wrote a little something on that I just shift over to the teacher and get back turned upside down. Hmm. Artists are out there exposed. The work is on the wall for everyone to see. That takes guts. It takes courage. Problem solving. I love to teach because it's all about problem solving. Students have problems. I help them solve it. I, and, you know, even if they're in tears, as if it's the end of the world, I tell them, it's okay. You just do this. Or how would you do this? What might work here? And they need to see me fail, too, and problem solve. But I love teaching because it's all about problem solving, and making artwork is all about problem solving. There's no way you can challenge yourself with an artwork that is unique, fresh, and original. You can't think through experience from start to finish. You have to walk through it, one day at a time, one painting at a time, one painting session at a time. It's, it, nobody has a crystal ball. You don't know how it's going to turn out until you get there. And you don't know what kind of problems are embedded in that artwork, just waiting to pop up. One time I was working on, I work on watercolor paintings that are three and a half by five foot. And of course I work flat on a table. Water drips. Uh, I have cats and dogs in my studio and my cat loved to sleep on top of my table. This was my Siamese cat. And I had just painted a sloppy red passage. It was all wet. And it was kind of isolated in the middle of a big white portion that was unpainted. Marfa got up from her nap and while I went to the kitchen to get a drink and walked right through the red passage and left little red pussy footprints on the rest of my painting. Red is a very permanent color. We're not going to easily get that up. Well, I had invested a large amount of time in that painting, and I'm not going to tear it up or turn it into coasters. Uh, I am going to figure out and problem solve what to do about those red footprints. And I love to tell that story because when I do show my own work, I put that painting up there and I dare anybody to find those footprints. 
they're still in there, but I have to go up and point them out. Okay? So I learn how to conceal instead of reveal. I learn how to make something subordinate instead of dominant. There's always options, and there's always a solution. If nothing else, you can always paint it black and work the shapes in. Well, first of all, you have to understand what the problem is. You can't just get mad and angry. All that emotional stuff gets in the way. Is that surprising? Artists are emotional, aren't they? They're drama queens, right? No. <laughs> That's the kiss of death. You need to calm down. Problem solve it. Okay? Try things. Breathe. So students need to understand that not everything they make is wonderful. Uh, they're not always going to hear. My, I explain my job sometimes is I'm in the business of telling people what they don't want to hear. Okay? They lead, need to accept and hear me and understand me. Students get so good at this, they're very insightful. And that right side of the brain is clicking in and suggesting intuitive ways of handling problem solving. Unexpected ways, creative ways. Who doesn't need that? That's a life skill. The better you are at it, the more you survive. I could, I could have called this presentation survival skills. Survival and thrive skills. So you need to understand it. Well, you've got to have a plan. When we were talking today uh, and having discussions this morning, it was pretty exciting. We were collaborating, exchanging ideas. I was talking to a variety of individuals, um, all different fields. Uh, and now discussion can continue while you've got to get a plan, a focus, a goal. Well, you got to do this. It's not going to get done by itself. You have to do it. You have to be disciplined. I walk into the studio every day. It's like a job. And I pick up the brushes and I paint. Whether I feel like it or not, if I don't do it, it won't get done. Um, if I worked only when I was struck by inspiration, I might work two to three times a year. I can't depend on that. And that's, that's another stereotype. So, and an interesting thing happens. I'm not sitting there five minutes when I'm not totally on the right side of my brain. Everything external doesn't exist and I am into that painting in another place, in another space. I call it connecting with my spirit. I call it connecting with my soul, with a higher power, you know, however you want to describe it. But I am channeling that energy through that experience. You must revise. And maybe I'll send you back to the drawing board again and again and again until it's accomplished and successful. Uh, Mike, the guy that likes wrestling, he's never complained. I send him back to the drawing board again and again and again, and he just does it. Of course, he's ex-military, so he's used to taking orders, but... Okay. Looking back at what you've done, learning to evaluate it, and getting some perspective, comparing it to other students' work getting my input, getting your colleagues' input, having discussions with them. You can't, you can't be disappointed by rejection. Um, I get rejected from exhibitions all the time. And so what? That's just somebody else's opinion. You know, we all have those opinions. So, to me, it doesn't matter. It's about this important. What's important to me is that act of creation. 
that experience in the studio while I'm working, while I'm drawing, even while I'm doing a demonstration for my figure drawing class. I, it, it, I might be doing it for five minutes and I just don't want to stop. That's what I love about making art. I love that. I love the feeling of that when it's happening. I know that. I feel lucky that I know that. Uh, I've made that choice, or it was really made for me. And there have been many times when I was discouraged uh, to do this, but I know it's only temporary, and I'll get over it. And I accept that because that's being human. This is what we do. Practice, practice, practice. This is what we do in our studio classes. The more you practice, the more experience you get with your practice, you get better. You get to professional level productivity. You get good at skills. You get good at thinking. You get good at trusting your intuition. Oh my gosh, intuition. It's so intangible. It scares people. Is that a real thing or not? And that's real commitment. When those students are in there at 3 o'clock in the morning and the pizza delivery store, uh, store comes knocking on the door, that's real commitment. If I see the trash can full of stuff, that's commitment. They're in there all night because they love it. Work ethic. Uh, work harder and smarter. I, I had a boss one time that said, don't work harder, work smarter. I think you've got to do both. It's a very competitive world. These, uh, uh, this is our instructor from Japan and one of his students pouring bronze in some plaster casts with the lost wax technique. You can't get frustrated. When you get frustrated, you stop and nothing gets done. What good, it is, what good is it if you never finish anything? So endurance contest. If you love doing this, you just love the act of putting the pigment on the surface. I love the act of just taking paint and brushing it on a surface. It's a sensuous experience. It's seductive. Endurance. She's carving stone. I think it's granite. We have visiting artists uh, in our department on a continuous basis, and we also have two resident artists per year in our department. We have new people. Uh, our whole faculty is tenured. And so this is fresh air and ideas and artwork and people injected into our environment on a continuous basis. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> a student. She's graduating in December with a degree in sculpture. She can weld. She can cut metal. She can cut stone. She can carve stone. She can cast bronze. This is not a gender issue. You can't be excused from welding because you're a female. Uh, and... Conversely, men can't ask to be excused from figure drawing when there's a nude male model up there. This is not about prurient interest. We, when we look, perceive, and see, we, believe me, we are not looking at you as a person. We're objectifying you. Again, what it is to be human, have realistic expectations. You're not going to get perfection. You're going to get human-made objects. They are not perfect. I was talking to the students in the class this week, and we have plates that are approximately the same size, and they don't, there's no two plates exactly the same. And my comment was, it's, it's okay. 
you know. It's going to be an organic edge. We want people to know human beings made this art, not machines. Ability to concentrate. You know, somebody walks in the room, yak, 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 music blaring, all kinds of distractions. You are right there in that artwork. You're not out there with the distractions. You are focused, doing your thing. It's almost as if the rest of the world doesn't exist. How do you concentrate? We learn how to do that, how to concentrate and focus. We teach our students to do this. He's in our Macintosh computer lab where we teach, uh, we don't teach cartoon animation or gaming, we have flash animation. So, too many freshmen having a party in your class while you're trying to get your drawing done? This is about respect for other individuals using the studio. Not only for respect for the facilities, we, we don't go in and trash out our environment. Somebody will have heck to pay if they do that. We have all kinds of OSHA rules where chemical go, chemicals go. I, I am not going to get another art room in my lifetime. Uh, I can't afford to have a reputation where I let students trash things and just go to the administration and say, uh, you got another $10,000 for a wood table. Uh, as I let the students burn it up. I let them cut it in half. I can't. I know my equipment, my facility is what I have for the duration of my tenure there at the university. So we all collectively take care of things. I'm not saying the students like to clean up and be responsible for those things, but while they're in my class, in my environment, they will behave professionally and respect the environment and respect the equipment. There's a sign that says, your mother doesn't work here. Clean up after yourself. I'm talking about a whole person. Healthy body, healthy mind. Uh, this is, uh, we have a brand new wellness center at the university. Here's some Caribbean students who uh, are playing soccer. This is just a catch game. There are organized uh, teams among the Caribbean students. I think uh, uh, if you want to talk about the Caribbean population on our campus, it's a very strong bonded community and you can Speak to Liska and Bernard after if you're interested. Well, how do you stay fresh and not frustrated when I have students build their stretchers? You know, they don't go to the store and buy them. They build them. I do give them canvas material, and they learn how to prepare them. And they're archival stretchers. Any professional could buy these stretchers, and they're beautifully made. Okay. I won't let them hang anything on the wall that warps or looks cheap. It has to be done right. I think that's a thing of grace and beauty. So the materials that we use, there's respect for them as well. So if you get frustrated, go take a break. Come back later. Um, the, a momentary period of anger where you bash things around is not healthy. Okay? So... Uh, and two more of our Caribbean students. Aren't they beautiful? This is Liska as a freshman. Yeah. Uh, she is in the cook pot down there uh, in sculpture. It's hot wax, uh, getting ready to probably make a model to be invested in uh, plaster for bronze casting. Oh, discipline, a routine. I have an exercise that I give my students. And it's two pages that are identical. And I say, go fill the first one out. It's scheduled from 7 a.m. in the morning till midnight. And I said, I want you to just record what you were doing and how much time you spent on it during the day. They come back the next week, and it's crap like Facebook, games, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Candy Crush, TV, eating, hanging out, 
And before you know it, 24 hours is gone, and you've done nothing. So we have to figure out time management. So we do the schedule again, only better. Don't waste time. Yeah. And if you want some time off, schedule it. A lot of people live by their planners. Get rid of that, all that wasted time. Usually they're astounded and shocked that they waste so much time. They're not aware of it. So the first thing is to put a mirror up to yourself. Accept it, change it, move forward. These are healthy productivity skills. Six, nonverbal communication. How do you carry yourself? What are you saying to people? How are you asking them to treat you as an individual? As an artist, we know I shared with you in the beginning, people have predetermined expectations of who you are without even knowing you, who you are as a person, what you do as an activity, what you are, uh, it, and perhaps they wouldn't even call it a profession. They might call it a pastime. So, you get from people what you ask from them. What are you asking from them? Are you asking for respect or are you laying down as a doormat? People treat you how you teach them to treat you. Visual awareness. I feel like I live in my right brain happily. I'm most at home there. But in the real world, I have to conduct myself within a context of a society that expects me to be articulate, intelligent, respectful, etc. Which I'm happy to do. And that is what we teach students to do. You cannot sit there and behave like a child and say, I'm an artist, I'm moody. Doesn't work. No way. Bad behavior is bad behavior. I don't care what you do for a living. And it's unacceptable. I talked about that earlier, so I'm just going to let you look at that picture for that long. I call it the reality check. I love this. Students are, are so left brain when they begin to draw they're, they're drawing furiously on their drawings. And they're drawing and they're drawing and they're drawing. What they're drawing is up there, but they're drawing and they're drawing and they're drawing. They're not looking at what they're drawing. So guess what they're drawing? They're making it up. It's something from their left brain that doesn't exist. Yeah. I love pointing that out to them. And that's what we do. We'll take the drawing. There's the subject matter. Last Halloween, I went out and I bought all these really bizarre pumpkins and gourds and set them up for the students to draw. And uh, this is Liska's drawing. And then we take the drawing on the drawing board, and I make my students stand to draw. If they sit, they're lazy. Before long, they're doing this. Uh-uh. Nope. Stand up. If I can stand for nine hours a day, and I'm going to be 60 years old in January, then they can stand too. It doesn't hurt me. I go home tired, but I'm not dead. <laughs> so we stand the drawing up right underneath the subject matter as the reality check. Okay? Do you see that angle? Uh-huh, your drawing goes like this, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you know why it didn't catch what's up there? Because you were drawing like this. You were not looking at what you were drawing. Simple things like that. The reality check. Okay. Can I talk to you? Will you accept what I say to you? It'll be sometimes with a little smart-ass humor, but I'm going to tell you what you need to do to make a better artwork 
or are you going to get all moody because I told you you had to work some more on it? That it's not quite there. And I've done this before. I know how to do it. And this is the way you do it. So please go back and practice, practice, practice. It's that simple. Do it some more. And when you do it some more, you will do it better. And that's true of anything, <laughs> not just making artwork. Ah, can you accept that somebody is going to say something about your work that might not even be true? They might be having a bad day. And they're going to share that with you. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> are you going to let it ruin your day or are you just going to go, eh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay, that's fine. They can think whatever they want. It's your job to extract the information and discern what matters and what doesn't matter. You can't do that right away. I'm there to help you figure that out. Yeah. So we learn to improve our evaluation skills. It's easy to look at someone else's work and evaluate it because it's not close to your heart. You didn't make it. What the real challenge is, when the teachers go away and you've graduated and you're working by yourself on your own in a corporation or a company, you will be expected to evaluate your work honestly and correctly because your job depends on it. If you don't know how to objectively evaluate what you've done and improve it on your own, if you haven't acquired those skills from your empirical education, oops, your job depends on it. We, you know, you don't have to be a happy camper all the time, but being positive sure helps. You can see that glass, and here's another cliche, is half empty or half full. I had a drink of, what was that drink this morning? Bar Barbie? Mobby. Okay. And, and Liska said, here, taste this. So I took a taste and I said, that's disgusting. And then I said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I started to identify some flavors. I said, is that anise in there? I took another sip. And it was a little root beer flavor. Well, that's the bark. And I said, there's some bitters in there. And I kept, and I almost drank the rest of her drink. Each sip, it got, it got better and better and better, and I can't wait to get some. Okay. So, you know, uh, I can't turn off to something, and, and, and really, among the group of friends that I travel with, I'm known for I'll eat anything, and lots of it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I love life's rich experiences. I want as much as I can wring from this life, the only one I have. So I don't want to shut down to something that on my initial um, take on it might not be so positive, but, you know, let's try that again. Let's. Edison took how many, he didn't learn how to make the light bulb the first time he tried it. Goodyear didn't learn how to make vulcanized rubber the first time he attempted it. They just found a lot of ways to not do it. We collaborate as artists. Part of the enhanced studio experience is we're in a classroom, folks. You may want to go isolate in a studio by yourself, but uh-uh. Nope. You're going to contribute to the whole. We need support groups, regardless of what we do. We need to surround ourselves with people that are going to be negative and detract from us and criticize us nonstop. I'm sorry. Those toxic people get to stay out of my circle of colleagues, of friends, of peeps and buds. Sorry. They don't get in. That's too toxic for me. I'm not going to make those poor choices. Okay. I don't have to tolerate someone just because they're there talking to me. That's being a doormat. I don't have to be rude to them. I don't have to be mean and cruel to them. I just smile and say, gotta go. Yeah. Okay. When they call me, I don't have to pick up the phone. 
and I can say with kindness and respect, uh, I have other plans. Thanks for asking. And eventually they'll get the idea. But you can't afford to have negativity around you that gets in the way of you doing what you need to do and want to do with your life choices. Other people inspire you. I love to steal ideas from other people. Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Objectivity. Objectivity. Collaboration. This is a drawing to assignment that each student is assigned a section in class, one section. It is part of a greater whole. I make my entire drawing two course about collaboration. They have to depend on each other. So sometimes leaders emerge, natural leaders among the students. That's not me. I have to allow the dynamics of the group to occur, however it's going to occur. And those students to bond together and pull together to create a wonderful artwork. These are purchased on campus by university uh, faculty, by buildings installed in their student art center. It's filled with student art. Uh, and so what emerges from that freshman year, second semester drawing two class, are students that I still Facebook with that say, I still talk to so-and-so. They bond for life. Those are wonderful memories that those people have from their freshman year. Just because they're freshman year doesn't mean they're making throwaway art. From the beginning, they will regard their artwork, their finished products as exhibition worthy. I have my students do matting, mounting, and framing. It's not throwaway art. It's not an assignment that, oh, okay, got it back. I have seen university classrooms where the students make things out of cardboard and tape. They get their assignments back from the instructor. On the way out of the room, they throw it in the trash can. That, that's teaching respect for the artwork. That's te that, is that how you think of yourself? Is that how much you're worth it? You're building lifetime relationships. We were doing a photo shoot. They were hanging Christmas lights. We made the room totally dark. And she did time-based artwork, recording all the moving lights for her senior exhibition. It was really, really beautiful photography. Compromise. If you work as a team, you need to learn give and take. Okay, all right, well, I want to do this. Well, how about I do it this time, and then next time you can do it shared. Shared. Wouldn't you like to be in charge of this? I'll be in charge of that. Negotiations. This is all stuff our Congress in the United States can't figure out how to do. Can't get along, can't work together. It is so ego-driven. This is not about I'm important, I'm big stuff, I'm going to be an art star. What's important is the quality of the work. So we teach some humility here. You know, It's about your best, best work and the dynamic of what you play in the greater part of the School of Art. And you take that legacy with you out into the profession. You teach regard for the profession, regard for what you do, regard for who you are and others. Common goal. That way students are creating artworks bigger than what they can do by themselves in shorter periods of time. Confidence building. Now that's a no-brainer with all of these skills that they're acquiring not just intellectual skills, social skills, coping skills, psychological skills, technical skills, aesthetic skills, 
intellectual skills, writing skills, speaking skills. Who doesn't need that? And we do it in front of other people every day, day after day. This young lady uh, is a Wiccan. That's witch in common language. And I don't know whether it's a phase. I don't know whether she's serious about it. I don't think she burns children or anything like that. But it's it's very playful. She's charming and sweet, and uh, you know she's doing the self portrait again, revisiting. There is a whole art history of artists who painted and made drawings and prints about witches, and so she must research. My students research all the time. They can't just, I like it, I'm going to paint it. No. Let's go find out about this. What are you doing here? Let's find out who did this before you, how they did it, and how you can do it in a more creative, unusual, original way. Camaraderie, that lifelong friendship that lasts. So they're building friendships through hard work in the studio, doing what they love, and not just out partying on the weekends. Our students work all day long, every day, weekends included. That's dedication. You wouldn't do this unless you love to do it. And if you don't love to do it, you need to go do something else. It's going to be a lot of work. And it's going to take time. It takes about 10 years, I think, for anyone to establish credentials as a profession who, professional who's going to stick around. When I first started to get national attention, it took about 10 years for me to finally start seeing rewards come my way. It's because people keep seeing your name over and over and over again. And visually, they have a visual association with what you do. That's when the jurying came in. That's when all of that nice stuff and acknowledgement and professional recognition started to pay off. There she is working late at night by herself. Following through, if I suggest you make revisions and your classmates and colleagues suggest this would make your work better. Do you do that? Or do you, eh, that's just more work. I'm not interested. Okay, go find something else to do. Maybe you're not suited for this profession. Liska said to me yesterday, she doesn't know where this painting is. She lost it. But there's, there's the pride in being exhibition worthy and enjoying in the public experience of an exhibition opening. And when someone wants to talk to you about your work, you don't just go, "Eh, well, eh, yeah, thanks. You can open a dialogue with them. You know what to say about the work, what it's about. You can have an intelligent conversation with someone about it. And, oh, by the way, did you know that I have prints editioned and I have affordable art that ranges from this to this. And I was doing this with a a new friend today, an economist. He got my business card and he didn't have any art on the wall. And I said, visit my website. We can fix you up all price ranges, three easy payments. (laughs) This is... You want to know why we work hard? Uh, Because we love it, but there are rewards. We uh, have an annual student exhibition every year, and there are lots of monetary awards. There are, if they work hard, they get scholarships. If they work hard, they get to go on trips to Grenada with their professors. And the university pays for it. My university. Yeah. And our hosts here have been so gracious to find them an apartment to live in. You should see this place. It's wowie zowie. We've been, we've been well taken care of here. This is such a pleasure. And so students really have pride in their work. 
You don't see things go in the trash can. You don't see them get frustrated and throw things away. They might throw it away and start over, but things don't end up in the dumpster. This is one of our visiting artists. And here's Bernard with his eyes closed. In an exhibition, students need to act with, interact with people outside of their common environment. They need ideas that really, Andrea and I were speaking about this the other day, that I am saying things that just reconfirms what she teaches her students. And you need sometimes other people to come in and say the same thing you do so that students will listen like they heard it for the first time. And accountability. I did this. I'm responsible for it. Okay. I can't act out in the classroom. I have to behave professionally. I can't stomp around and throw my books. I can't damage somebody else's artwork because I'm jealous because they're better of me, better than me. I can't turn things in late. My professor doesn't accept anything late. If I turn something in late, they'll look at me and say, well, that's nice, but it's still a zero. And no, you don't get to turn it in in your portfolio. It's a zero. It's a missed opportunity. I'm sorry, those are the consequences of your choices, which were poor. Take responsibility for it. Your dog didn't make you turn it in late. Your roommate didn't turn it in late. You chose not to get it in on time. It's your responsibility. Okay, we don't do perfect things. Okay? If I mess up, I mess up. Okay. Whoops. I'll get over it. Move on. I'm not going to go into a deep depression and stay in bed for a week because I made a mistake. Acknowledge it. Move forward. Keep going. Why? Who's going to win if I stop making art? If I get rejected from seven shows in a row, am I going to throw away my brushes? Heck no. That's just seven other people's opinion. Big deal. What's the result of the people that we graduate? If they get through these classes successfully, they should have a tour de force exhibition at the end of their degree. It's called a capstone course, and it's called senior exhibition. This is a drawing to assignment. So what you see on the wall is a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree professional exhibition. They're credentialized once they get their degree and once they pass all of their coursework. So I hope that I've opened your perception about artists, what they do as a profession, what they do to make a living is anybody's guess. You could choose myriad professions with an art education. But it's the education, the education, the training of the whole individual that we do. It's not just, let's make a painting of a tree like your instructor. Here, use this green and use this brush and move this way. That is not what we do. So I hope I've opened the doors of your perception a little bit more today. If you are an artist, yay, you go. Keep doing it. Do it better. Do it more. Do it louder. Be proud. That is a really wonderful way to embrace your spirit and to express it. Don't let anyone silence you. Keep persevering. And I would like to conclude by saying I'm going to say thank you and I'm going to recognize a few people, but 
Uh, I understand that this has uh, been a little lengthy. I have a seven minute video that ends this presentation that Lizka and Bernard put together. And right now I would like to introduce both of them if you would stand up and uh, turn around and allow everyone to acknowledge you. Didn't they put together a wonderful PowerPoint? And uh, if, if you need to leave, feel free to escape at this point. Uh, I understand that I will probably be taking some questions, but first I want to show you this video. Uh, and again, both of the students created this. This is the three color process that we did this week in the classroom. And next week we're going to do this with painting.
And this is Bernard's print, and those of you in class did see the actual print. all student work that you're looking for. It's all undergraduate. This is our graphic design and photography program work. is a professional work. This is work done by uh, another visiting artist that has been at Midwestern for the entire fall semester. And he's from Japan. He goes around the world and he does this. Ford. Thank you. Uh, like to thank Oliver Benoit. Oliver really spearheaded with Dean uh, Ted Hollis the application to the Fulbright Association, and I'd like to thank the Fulbright. Uh, foundation for uh, sponsoring my trip uh, and the ambassador for visiting this afternoon and uh, everyone that was in the classes and uh, thank you so much for being here. I guess at this point I can take questions if there are any. Yes. Art should have substance and content and depth. It may not be a narrative story. It may be something as simple as the artistic and intellectual breakthrough of Jackson Pollock's paintings were the act of making the painting. The painting existed as a record of his dance with the paint. New in innovation. Uh, the abstract expressionists, what was new and innovative about their work is that there was nothing real about the canvases except just the paint on the surface. They weren't painting anything other than. They weren't referring to anything outside of the fact that it was just 
black paint and red paint on a canvas surface. So yes, there's always content and meaning. If, if it is, is a professional exhibition, if it's in a museum, but it may not be speaking to you in your nonverbal language. And that's part of learning to appreciate and study art. It, it doesn't happen simply because you look at it. Yeah. So that's what confuses a lot of people. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be instant message straight into your brain. Yeah. It's a learned skill through observation and dialogue and reading and education and etc. cetera. Yeah. Doesn't mean you can't, ah, oh, like the red. It doesn't mean you just can't have a simple response to it. Or just because I dislike an artwork and there's lots of work I don't like, it can't educate me. It can't inform me. If nothing else, it can tell me, it can go on the list of things I don't like and don't want to do. Yes, and things I don't want to put in my house over my couch. Yes, good question. Yeah, good question. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. I agree. I, I think they're essential skills for the survival and thriving of a human being. Yes. In a global uh, society. Yeah. I agree. What my purpose was to let you know that we do this as artists, as in any other profession. And some people don't expect that artists would engage all of those concepts and behaviors in what we do in the classroom. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Yes. That's an excellent question also. I have, uh, in my drawing class, I have five art majors and six non-art majors. We like to get people in our studio classes instead of our lecture classes. We want them to have the actual experience. That way they can learn firsthand that, oh, this isn't easy. This is hard. This takes time. I can't do this right now. They have to have patience. It's going to take them weeks to learn how to draw. This is just one semester. We're just going to scratch the surface. We like non-majors in our class. We do not have different classes for non-majors. Even our continuing education people, we mainstream them right in the studio all together. Why not? They have to live together in real society. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Yes.
it's whatever the market will bear. What can you sell it for? Uh, it, it, the world was astounded that a Van Gogh painting sold for $1.6 million, right, of the irises a few years back. He, he never sold anything while he was living. His brother had to support him. Van Gogh only spent five years making artwork. Would he be amazed if he were alive today? Yeah. It's not like the price of gold, yeah, for sure. I'm not an expert on pricing artwork or selling artwork, but uh, interesting stories, yeah. Does art have an intrinsic value? That's a philosophical question, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I suppose we could have a debate. Pros and cons. Who says it does? Who says it doesn't? There'd be good ar arguments on, on both sides. Yeah. Uh, the intrinsic value of one of my watercolor paintings would be the cost of the materials, which isn't very much but I've got a bigger price tag on it than that. Uh, so it, it is also a reflection of an artist's self-esteem and how valuable their time is. I'm gonna have a fire sale with some of the artwork that I don't wanna keep anymore around Christmas. And I've decided in some cases, I'm just gonna say, what's your best offer? I don't want it around anymore. I don't want to look at it. It's, it's not close to my heart anymore. I'll never show it again. Uh, as a practical businesswoman, I, instead of throwing it in the dumpster, I'm gonna, you want to offer me something for the frame? You know, if you want to, it's a piece of paper, what would, you, what would you offer me for it? And I'll put low prices on it just to see it fly out the door. So, uh, it's negotiable is my best answer, <laughs> like you found out. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, would you? Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So from your own experience, how do you teach people to appreciate art? How do you get them to understand that? Or how do you get them to deeply appreciate art? Because it's one thing for people to have the skill or to develop the skill, but it's another thing to have people to appreciate the skill that people demonstrate. Uh, yes. Uh, to the first question, uh, I'm not going to give it away. I'll do what is comfortable for me, or else I, I won't let it go, yeah. Um, and the second question, as an artist or an art educator, I find that we justify our existence around the clock continuously because of, of common misperceptions and attitudes. And I can't get angry about that anymore. It just is. I accept that. So part of my job as, as a professional and an emissary and someone who speaks to audiences like yourself is I understand it's a continuous education and re-education process. And we do it through dialogue. We do it through things like this. So when I leave, you start planning on who you want to bring here next. And in the meantime, you all, I'll leave you with information. And you all can share that together, and you become the word of mouth. You know how to, and, and again, it's not as though I'm in a defensive position here. I am happy to speak to you about what the real life of an artist is and an art educator. But uh, it is continuous education and re-educate. You get a new administrator? You got to start over. You get new people on the Arts Council, you have to start over. But if people are willing, the willingness and it, a friendly dialogue, 
that's not painful. That doesn't hurt anyone. Who should be threatened by that? Who's fearful of that? Yeah. So as, as, as long as you, you uh, don't have knockdown down drag outs about it and, yeah, you win some, you, will, you lose some. Pick your battles. Yeah. Don't fall on your sword over everything. Yeah. Some things are worth it. Some things are little. Yeah, let it go. Maybe we'll pick it back up later. So it's, you know, it, it's a constructive strategy, too. Yeah. If you build consensus and you start with your core group of people with a vested interest and you build consensus and your support group works together towards a common goal, you'll get there. You'll get there. You'll get there. You have to start somewhere. You have a strong core group of people here that I've met just in three days. Yes. And they come from all walks of life. This gentleman, faculty from the medical school, he's here to say, yeah, I get this. I get this. We do this too. You have more alike in common than you do differences. Yes. And it's through shared dialogue like this, it's where you begin. Yes. And understanding where you're both coming from. Yes. Good question. Thank you. Good questions. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Good question. How do you know when you're ready to get your stuff out there? Put it out there. Test it. Get a response. Get some feedback. If it comes back to you and you're rejected, go back to the studio, get some feedback, work on re improvement, get it out there again. Try, try, try. Practice, practice, practice. Perseverance. Do it. Test it. Have the courage. Don't let fear hold you back. Fear is the big bogeyman of all artists and creative people. And listening to other people rather than listening to your internal voice. Yes. Good question. Seek out those people who will support you. Detach from those people who are toxic and negative. Anyone else have any comments or questions? I see some friendly faces out there and some familiar faces. Thank you for coming today. It's been a pleasure. I will be here through the weekend, all through next week, and leaving on Saturday. So come see us. Come visit at uh, Professor McLeod's classroom on TAMCC. And the art room, come see what we're doing. Come visit with us. If you're curious, if you don't know what this is about, please come by. Okay? Thank you so much. So let's give a round, a rousing round of applause again.